So I wanted to start off talking a little bit about why this happened. And as we just mentioned, Kurt McCarty was an advisor to the Hall of Fame. He was a teacher in upstate New York for 35 years. But what's really interesting about him is he was the last coach to coach SU baseball in the varsity program that's alive today. Nobody else that coached the program is alive. And most of the players, if they are alive, they're from the late 50s and early 60s because the program ended in 1972. Um, so I wanted to talk about that when he told me it was 50 years. And as we kind of went along, he did a lot of interviews and then he got me in contact with some other former players. And we'll kind of highlight some of the former players here and kind of the program's success. Um, so yeah, thanks for, thanks for listening. Um, so an overview, the program was actually surprisingly good, right? Upstate New York, cold weather, you wouldn't expect baseball to be nationally strong. You, know, you can't practice until March, maybe April. And in Syracuse, a lot of times you're just in a gym or you're in a barn and you're playing schools from other states. Even if it is Pennsylvania, they're you know, a whole month ahead a lot of time. Um, but there was 93 seasons of SU baseball, starting in 1873. Um, went until 1941, there was a six year break from World War II, and then they went all the way to 1972. And they basically had three main coaches. Will Carr will talk about, he had a 34 season run. And that's one of the longest for SU sports. So we had Teddy Kleinhans and Mogish. And what really stood out to me is I would have never expected this. SU had 23 players play in the MLB. Wow. And in every decade, there was at least one player who debuted. So this was a very good program. This was not just you know, a random college team. And in fact, Jim Constanti won the M MVP in 1950 for the Phillies. And he was a reliever for them. And Dave Gusty, he was an all-star. He won the World Series of Pirates. He led the league in saves in 1973, another 15-year you know, career great player. Billy Connors was a pitching coach for 17 years in MLB. He was a pitching coach for the Yankees in 2000 when they won the World Series. And Andy Pettit in the 4-4. Um, so SU baseball really made a presence, and they had some great seasons. 1961, they made it to Omaha, right? They're playing against Texas, Duke, Boston College, Colorado State, a lot of powerhouse programs, and then you have Syracuse, and they almost won the tournament, actually, which is pretty shocking. Um, in 1968, they led the country in runs per game, which is, again, a pretty big deal in Syracuse. And now we're 50 years from the past season. So they really had a small roster, right? A lot of Southern teams would have 25, 35 guys or even 40. Today you're going at 40 plus. They had 14 to 20. So you're talking four or five pitchers and maybe one or two subs to the field, and that's your whole team. Um, and in the NCAA, there was no varsity for freshmen until 1972, so you always had your varsity and freshman team. And then again, they didn't have a lot of training. Like Herm said, they would work out if they wanted to for fun. Maybe they go in the weight room, but they shared with their entire team. They maybe had one squat rack and one set of dumbbells. These were guys that, they were athletic, but it's not today where they're basically amateurs and they're spending you know, 40 hours a week on the sport. Um, they had an advantage, actually. When Manly Fieldhouse was built, which we can see right here on the inside, that's actually me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, there's, now it's turf, so now it's a practice field. It's very nice. But in the 60s when it was built, they had a dirt floor and they could take fly balls, it's you know, a 50 foot ceiling, and they could actually get real practice in for their last 10 years, and that helped them for sure. Um, but what really stands out is they only had two scholarships. So today you have 14 to 15 scholarships for baseball, and they had one pitcher and one catcher on scholarship for the last 20 years. And yet they still made it to the World Series. So here's some lists of orange men in the majors. We have John Coleman here. He pitched 54 complete games in 1883. Again, he was on a Philadelphia team, and I think they're one of the worst in the National League. But still, that's, that's a pretty big deal. Um, Jim Constanti, again, he won the MVP in 1950. And then we have Dave Gusty, who was an all-star 15-year career, Billy Connors. Mike Barlow was a closer for the Blue Jays in 1980 for a point. So he had a lot of you know, very good players from Syracuse. So we have Jim Constanti in the middle. He had a pretty long career. Basically a junk pitcher. He was not a high velocity guy. Um, and there's him. As well. So in the early days, again, I said it was started in 1870. So when they started, they actually played in Archibald Stadium for a while, which was kind of like a Coliseum type thing where the Carrier Dome is today. Um, 
And they were very good. They played the Ivy Leagues basically every year. We had a series in Michigan every year. We'd go to Ann Arbor, we'd play in Syracuse. We had an annual series in Columbia for 40 years. We'd go to you know, New York City or Syracuse. And Syracuse was always around 500. They were pretty competitive. There's a lot of records of each season that they did. And in 1915, they were one of the best teams in the country. And they basically beat every major team they played. And so with the second best record, they were crowned as the best team. There was no like World Series back then. Um, so here we can see Blue Car, who was their famous coach for 30 years. And this is where they used to play. Today, this is Hall of Languages. It's very iconic at Syracuse. If you watch a basketball game, sometimes they'll show it during TV timeouts. And here we have Tali. And they basically played what's today the quad. And they had these horses that would use these troughs. And they would basically like turn the dirt over. Um, and we have a better picture of that right here. Here we have a hill, which is now some freshman dorms, the mouth, as my friend Tommy here actually lived there freshman year. Um, and so they used to play on what's now the quad, and it was very informal. Um, but that was their old field. There's a better picture, 1904. And that's today. <laughs> so we have a statue for Onondaga Nation here, and the home plate was right around here, and it's obviously very well built up today. So this is Archibald Stadium. It was very famous when it was built, one of the biggest coliseums in the country in 1907. This is where SU played, and we have some more photos here. You can see the photo. You can see the photo. This was just the scene for perspective. This is where the Carrier Dome is now. You can see the campus. So if I'm going to talk about this, I can't not talk about Blue Car. Blue Car was a law school graduate of Syracuse. He actually played next to Honus Wagner, who was a Hall of Fame shortstop for the Pirates for many years. Um, but he didn't really have a great career. He had some injuries and he had some family things, so he had to go back to school. Um, but when he graduated from law school, SU needed a coach because up to that point in 1910, it was play or lay, much like club baseball today. And he was turned out to be the perfect candidate. And he basically is Syracuse baseball. And they built a field for the baseball separately and they named it after him. And here is Coach Carr. And there is also Coach Carr's dad. And this was in 1915. Um, also, Jim Crane, he played one year at Syracuse in 1891. Some of you guys might know the Red Badge of Courage. It's a very mm -hmm. well-known Civil War book. He was born after the war started, and he never been in the war himself, but it was a bestseller for many years. It's, there's still news about it. It's still available for print. It's a good book. So the new era was with World War II and Clint on pause. So for six years in the 1940s, they were on pause. And the second era is when they went to the World Series and did pretty well. So here's a field. Um, I'll later show what it looks like today. There is no baseball field there. Um, but this was on South Campus. There's street up. The and windows are vulnerable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a barn building. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> keep scoring the broken windows. Yeah. <laughs> there was a joke that if you could hit it there, you might go to the pros and stuff like that. <laughs> but it wasn't very, it wasn't very common actually like that. There's another photo. I love this photo. It's the only color picture I have of the field currently. And you can see one other person interviewed, um, New York State Senator John D. Francisco, someone might have heard of. He played on the team, he was a captain in 1968. Now you have Hart Ricard, who I'll talk about a little more on the right. They were pretty good friends, they're playing Cornell right here. It's a pretty nice stadium. Here's a dedication. Some more pictures of the field right here. And at the podium, this is actually Luke Carr when he was in his 80s. He dedicated the field, and he's talking to the current team in 1952. So the, the big team is 1961. Right? This is when Syracuse baseball becomes nationally known, and they actually, you know, almost win the whole thing. Um, they had players from the football team because SU football won the championship two years before, and so they really had a boost of athleticism there. And they had two major leaguers, Connors, who coached in the, for the Yankees for a while, and then they had Dave Gustin, who coached for the Pirates. Um, and they did very well. They had their third baseman made the all-tournament team at that tournament. So you know you have nine guys on a roster of the best players in Omaha, and one of them was from Syracuse. So for eight teams, that's pretty good. 
Here we have the coach. This was in the yearbook we actually get. This is all they had, right? They go to the World Series, they do this amazing thing, and all you see in the yearbook for a text is this paragraph. <laughs> so even then, football is a priority, but it's, it's still plenty to see. Um, here we have the list of teams in the tournament. Um, like I mentioned, Texas, USC was the winner. Um, Oklahoma State beat us twice with the Cowboys mm. there. <laughs> but at the time, they were pretty good. They beat us twice. And then we have a little graphic here. We won, then we lost Oklahoma State. We win the loser bracket game, and then we lose in the semifinals mm -hmm. right here. So. Um, so here's the team. They had 17 players, which is small. So I'm looking at that. It's 25, 30. Um, and they go on the plane to Omaha right here. So they had special jackets. They had like orange baseball emblazoned on them. Oh, yeah. Really cute. Yeah. Uh, so you can see it a little bit. Not great. So Coach Klein Hands, he coached for 20 years. Um, he really led that team. And what's cool about him was he was a big pitching guy, so he taught some of his players off-speed pitches they used in the pros. And he was a big SU player. His kids and his nieces and nephews all played sports at SU, so he was pretty well a part of our kid, and I do appreciate what he did for our program. Here we have Billy Connors. Um, cool picture with him with Randy Johnson. Obviously, we win it, one of the best pitchers of all time. And Andy Pennant, part of the 4-4. Playing days, not so successful, but he did play a few years. And he coached in the majors for a while. Mm -hmm. He actually hit two home runs in Omaha. That was pretty big. I think he was the only player to hit multiple home runs in that tournament. That was really cool. And here's Gusty. This is a picture of him in 1960 in Penrith, MLB team. So now we have the 1968 season. This was another team that did well. Led the country in runs per game. Now, mind you, they didn't know that. Right? Today, you look online and they have leaderboards and you can see ERA and wins and all these things. The next spring, everyone was basically off campus except Herm Cardi. He gets the umpire 300 page manual with the back end stats. And he's going through, he's going through. And he sees all of a sudden that the team was at the top of the list in runs per game. And so he starts calling all his teammates, and they're like, no way, you're, you're, you know, you're bullshit. You know? And it turns out that he wasn't, and he started trying to, like, vax it to someone, and you know, they came to see him and showed him. Um, so that was a really cool little moment at the time. And they knew they were going to be good because when they go to the Southern trip on spring break, they actually finish 500. They're, like, 4-4 like four or, four or something. And most of the time, Syracuse would go to March, and they get killed because they just haven't played enough. And I, I like to talk about this team because the people on the team have made a lot of contributions to society after. And whenever I try to pitch SU baseball in the future, it's nice to note that like, when you have a baseball team, you can actually really help the community. And you can generate alumni by donating to the school. And as a school alumni, <laughs> that's what they want. <laughs> so, I, always, I always bring up this team because they, they generated alumni, and that's nice. Um, there's I love this one right here. This is a great picture. <laughs> There's the guy I interviewed a lot, Herman Carr. He's right there in the bases. So again, this is kind of just a general overview. Um, there were some very big players from that team. The captain became the New York State Senator for many years. Um, the catcher became the chief financial officer of Syracuse, which is a huge job considering we're billion dollar endowment university today. So we're you know, a big university. Um, an outfielder became dean of a hotel management school at the University of South Carolina, Dr. Mahalik, who also interviewed for this project, very interesting. And then we have Mike Barlow, who pitched in the majors for seven years. Um, so Herm Carr, he worked at the Hall of Fame, and what's awesome about him is he's the last living coach. So the next thing I hope to do with this project is kind of a documentary where I interview Herm Card and some of these other players because now they're in their 70s. And 
in 20 years, who knows what, you know, if we can tell these stories anymore. Um, so Herm was a third baseman, very scrappy, got a lot of power, singles, doubles, hitter, made all the plays in the field. And he became a baseball legend. He worked at the Hall of Fame. He was a poet and he was a writer and he taught English in high school and he helped curate information here. Um, and he, he was a Hall of Fame umpire for New York State for high school um, and really contributed to baseball as well. He also talked for <coughs> many hours as I did this, so shout out to Herm Carter. <coughs> um, so here we have Herm, which was five years ago. And then we have his friend, Di Francisco. And in the middle, they left an opening for one of their teammates, mm. Joe Smith, who was a pitcher on the team. Mm. And he actually founded Syracuse Orthopedic Specialists at Syracuse, which is one of the big orthopedic centers. Um, mm. So they left an opening for him and a tribute to him for when they used to do this at this exact spot 45 years before. Mm. Um, mm. So that was a very cool photo. Gracious to have that. So why did they cut baseball, right? They're a good team, why is it not, you know, why does the university cut it? Perfect storm. Um, there were financial issues, but I don't think those were really real because they actually, SU offered to travel with Lamore in another Syracuse school. And every weekend they go to the same place and play the same games. So the school would only have to split bus costs, basically. And at the time, the policy board just kind of rejected it. They're like, oh, we don't need another sport. There's crisis with the OPEC oil embargo. Title IX is coming, and we want to grow and football to be good again. And a list of reasons they wanted to take down the field. Um, so it kind of just wasn't meant to be. Um, so the last season, this is the photo right here of the last play. They had a good year, um, but the last play, they're playing at the Chief Stadium today, Syracuse Mets. They're down one to nothing in the bottom of the seventh. And as Herm tells the story, they have a runner on first with two outs. Ground ball at third base, throw it to first, overthrow. So Herm's at third base and he's sending the runner, sending the runner, and as the runner comes home, the right fielder makes a perfect throw. Bang, 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 the plate, they call him out. And that was the last play. Okay. I don't know how they got a picture of this. Yeah. And that's it. That's the shot right there. Uh, that's for sure. This is the only photo of this team in the rest of that play. So there's Wood, this was me like probably six or seven years ago. He was the ace on that college team. And I include him really because not only is he ace, he became a pitching coach in Syracuse and he trained guys like Pat Corbin, who was a star for the Nationals, helped them win the World Series in 2019. And he told me explicitly, he's had a lot of players where if they could go to Syracuse and play D1 baseball, they would have. But instead they went to Lemoyne, which is a good school now where they go to other programs because you don't have to play there. So he really believes that if they had a team, they'd be very good, but alas, we do not. Um, so again, we talked about why they don't have it. Uh, we want to quickly talk about club today. We've been around for 40 years off and on. Uh, we have 70 to 80 players try out for six spots a year. So there's a lot of interest in our, in our community for the team. Um, and here's a graphic that Tommy's brother back there actually designed. Uh, Tom Hitter, Tom's our president. Uh, we play like 15 games a year. So you know, we travel for weekends and play tournaments, and it's a pretty good time. Uh, but we don't have a field. You can see where we practice today. It's basically just a rugby pitch with some goal posts down there. It's just a practice field. And this on the left is the old baseball field. It's field hockey now. Um, and again, it kind of, there's reasons why we should have it. Again, there's a lot of support. Uh, we also have a sports analytics program, so a lot of our students want to work for major league teams and it'd be a great way for them to get hands-on experience with baseball. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really all I have. I have some pictures here of our current team. Um, we're actually pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> you can see we have some pictures here. Um, the Mets, you can see me right there. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank Thanks you. for